Okay, I'm going to try to stand up, and I have to hold the mic because they're recording this. So, so many topics suggest themselves to introduce this moving, challenging, and beautifully written book. Let me mention briefly four that I considered on the way to the one I finally chose so you can get a sense of the book's richness. One was the topic of style and form, for the book ends with a kind of philosophical dialogue, witty and also deeply reflective, between the author and the historian who is the book's subject. The question of the philosophical dialogue, its role, its importance as a form to probe and inquire in an open-ended way, is one that readers will have rich occasion to ponder. Another topic pertains to the book's chapter on Sarkar's notion of character, for though Depeche comments briefly on some of the antecedents of this idea in Western political thought that were important for Sarkar, I thought it would be fruitful to say more about the Greek and Roman Stoics and also the Hellenistic biographer Plutarch, who certainly lie in the background somewhere. I rejected this topic because it was pertinent only to one section of the book and not an introduction to the whole book, but it is a, a good topic. Then, there were two modern writers whose thoughts seemed worth bringing more fully into conversation with the ideas of Jadunath Sarkar. One is the great B.R. Ambedkar, who is in fact discussed in the text. On page 211, Depeche compares Ambedkar's ideas about nation building to those of Sarkar, <coughs> suggesting very persuasively, that Sarkar's skepticism of street politics and mass movements can be fruitfully compared to Sarkar's ideas, meaning that Sarkar is not merely a westernized reactionary. Since I've recently been immersed in writing about Ambedkar's legal vision and also his attack on caste, I was excited about this parallel, but again, it belongs to only one stretch of the text. More pertinent to Sarkar's overall interpretation of the Mughal Empire, are the ideas of my friend and collaborator Amartya Sen in his books, The Argumentative Indian and Identity and Violence, The Illusion of Destiny. I'm pretty sure Sen never read Sarkar, I'll, I'll certainly have to ask, but the two come up with very similar conclusions, praising Akbar's tolerant vision as the best foundation for a nation in the future and strongly criticizing Aurangzeb for setting things on a course that in Amartya's view, like Sarkar's, led um, ultimately to a politics of religious polarization. This theme is more central to the book's overall discussion of nation building, and yet it's more about Sarkar than about Depeche's overall achievement in writing this book about Sarkar. So, I've decided to turn to the theme of genealogy, in the sense given this word by my teacher, the distinguished British philosopher Bernard Williams, following Nietzsche, but also, as we'll see, departing from Nietzsche in a crucial way. Depeche's overall project is not to write a biography of Sarkar. It is by studying Sarkar in his social and intellectual context to understand the formation of a professional discipline of history writing in India focused on certain values and virtues, in particular those of dedication to facts and truth based upon a gathering of facts. Although Depeche makes clear throughout, especially in that wonderful dialogue at the end, the fact that these virtues are not fully the same as those that he and other contemporary historians are pursuing, he evidently views the earlier account of professional history with not merely antiquarian interest, but instead in a deeply admiring, if dialectical, <clears throat> and at times contestatory spirit, as part of a story of which he is a later and somewhat skeptical part. So I think it's not a stretch to see the book as a type of genealogy of the concept of the professional historian and the virtues proper to that role, which continue to be the topic of deliberation and debate. So it's here that I think it's useful to turn to Bernard Williams. In Williams' last finished book, Truth and Truthfulness, Williams turns to Nietzsche's idea of genealogy for a model of cultural, uh, uh, cultural and theoretical inquiry that should help us understand how a notion to which we attach value arose. A functional account of something that one might not expect to have, a functional account. There's much more detail, of course, but the idea is that a narrative may help us understand how a notion or notions acquired a centrality for us that might otherwise seem mysterious. For the rest of the book, Williams then produces such a genealogy of the notions of truth and truthfulness, with particular reference to history writing, trying to clarify the questions in human society to which truthfulness delivers an answer. <clears throat> 
In a closely related way, it seems to me, Depeche delivers a social and functional account of notions constitutive of the profession of academic history, notions that otherwise might seem somewhat arbitrary. Studying Sarkar and his circle helps him to locate the motivation for the role of archives, the role of research, and the role of ideas of factual objectivity in an overall enterprise that is not isolated from society, but located in a complex social framework that centrally includes the idea of nation building. Whereas Williams seeks ultimately to defend the value of truth from a variety of skeptics, Depeche's own approach is somewhat more skeptical and interrogative. But one cannot avoid the conclusion that the values central to Sarkar exercise for him a deep fascination and retain a marked significance, despite the questions that one might and should raise. Now here's then where Williams and I think Depeche depart from Nietzsche. For Nietzsche, at least where morality is concerned, the focus of his genealogical inquiry, the use of genealogy is ultimately subversive. What we come to understand is that morality is not just disunified, it's also something of a hodgepodge. Its pieces don't fit together, and they certainly don't serve a useful function for our present context. As my younger colleague Alexander Prescott Couch says in his fine article, quote, Williams and Nietzsche on the significance of history for moral philosophy, the value ultimately, quote, and this is a quote from Alex, ends up a kind of amalgam in the process of trying to repeatedly shoehorn a foot into a series of different boots. <laughs> one ends up with a pretty deformed foot, which importantly is not suitable to any one particular boot. For Williams and Truth, for example, by contrast, the genealogical project is more optimistic. By tracing the biographical story of our concept of truth, we come to know ourselves more fully. It's like writing the biography of an individual life and the self-knowledge thereby gained, while not necessarily altogether unified or without ongoing tensions and questions, is ultimately, as William says, vindicatory. We see that there is a more or less coherent story to be told. We see how we became who we are and we don't dislike ourselves or reject our story. As Williams concludes, quote, if the genealogy of truthfulness is vindicatory, it can show why truthfulness has an intrinsic value, why it can be seen as such with a good conscience, why a good conscience is a good thing with which to see it, end quote. Now, of what sort ultimately is Depeche's genealogy of professional history and its virtues? Clearly, it's not the hostile Nietzschean debunking sort. There's too much respect for Sarkar, too much desire for a deeper understanding of what he was about. Nor does Depeche suggest that the elements of Sarkar's project are ultimately incoherent. On the other hand, it isn't a straightforward Williams-like vindicatory genealogy. There's too much uneasiness, too much of a sense of estrangement. It's not a straightforward self-discovery of the sort that Williams describes. And yet, with all its skepticism, it seems to me somewhat closer to that sort of genealogy than to the other one. And perhaps it is a more honest sort than the ideal that Williams depicts in its frank yet respectful skepticism, its sense that things have changed, we are estranged from our past, and the simple virtues of the past cannot be simply recovered. In any case, I hope this sketch gives an idea of why this book is of tremendous interest, going well beyond its particular subject, a courageous confrontation with both self and other, and the relationship between the two. Okay, I'll stand too. It's uh, good to be able to see people's faces. The Calling of History is not your typical Depeche Chakrabarty book. Uh, it's low on theoretical scaffolding. Neither Marx, nor Heidegger, nor Foucault makes it into the index. But Carlyle, Gibbon, Macaulay, Shakespeare, and Tagore get multiple citations. And in fact, uh, Leopold von Ranke clearly wins the citation index derby. Uh, that is, leaving aside Sarkar himself and his uh, assorted contemporary friends and enemies. The book is, I found, quite moving and rather melancholy as a meditation on the life, the thought, and it's hard to avoid the word, the character, 
of Sir Jadrunath Sarkar. Sarkar was a distinguished and highly prolific Indian historian, a specialist in the history of the Mughals, uh, who was active through the first six decades of the 20th century. He seems to have been the founding figure of scientific history in India. A commanding figure through the 1930s, he was increasingly eclipsed by more nationalist historians in the 1940s and thereafter, and his works, which focused on political and military history of kings and emperors, were of virtually zero interest to the Marxist historians who were Depeche's teachers in the 60s and 70s, only a few years after Sarkar's death in 1958. The origin of this book was Depeche's more or less random encounter in the stacks of uh, good old Regentine Library um, with a collection of letters between Sarkar and his lifelong friend Sardesai, uh, a distinguished historian of the Marathas who shared most of Sarkar's views. These letters have provided Depeche with an extraordinarily detailed and intimate record of Sarkar's conception of history as an enterprise, of his struggles to establish a truly scientific approach to the discipline in India, and his stern and highly disciplined character. A splendid cache indeed for the curious historian. But why, one might ask, should this particular historian, Dipesh Chakrabarti, decide to spend several precious years of his life writing this book? After all, Dipesh's interests have always revolved around socioeconomic and cultural history. He certainly doesn't share Sarkar's uh, Ronkian passion for reconstructing high political history via Eigenweg gewesen, as it really was. Um, I'd be interested to hear more from Dipesh about precisely why uh, he found Sarkar's story so gripping. Now, I suspect that the attraction to Sarkar's story arises at least in part from Depeche's sympathies for a scholar who staunchly, if unsuccessfully, resisted his contemporaries' bending of history to the purposes of Hindu and ethnic nationalism, a tendency, after all, uh, far too common in present-day Indian political life. But it's also, and I think more fundamentally, uh, the curiosity awakened in Depeche about what one might call the prehistory of the Indian historical scholarship he encountered as a student and has since embodied as a professor. Even a quick scanning of the letters, of Sarkar's, let Sarkar's, uh, Sarkar's letters, um, would reveal a devotion to historical scholarship that was certainly equal to anybody's. Um, but that was also uh, curiously alien in its ethos uh, from that inhabited by Depeche or by me or by most of our contemporaries. <clears throat> Living and thinking with Sarkar for a decade or so surely has made Depeche aware that the way one pursues historical truth is as historically particular and in the end as historically fleeting as any other cultural pursuit. To follow the initial triumph and eventual eclipse of this admirable and stalwart historian imparts a moral lesson of humility that aging scholars like Depeche and me, and perhaps younger scholars <laughs> as well, would do well to ponder. It's a rather stoical, I think, uh, uh, um, attitude, philosophical attitude. Hayden White has asserted that historical narratives are plotted according to a limited number of historical tropes, and literary tropes for that matter. Uh, Depeche's story of Sarkar seems to be clearly plotted as a tragedy. In tragedies, the uh, admirable but all too human heroes are, in the end, undone by their tragic flaws. Sarkar was certainly a strong-minded and virtuous man. Uh, he had great intellectual gifts. He made himself the master of Persian Mughal sources. His English prose was absolutely masterful, uh, as we can see from the many uh, quotations of, uh, of his prose. <clears throat> his devotion to the collection, criticism, collation, and narration of historical facts was absolutely unstinting. As Depeche remarks, Sarkar's pursuit of truth as he understood it had the quality of an ascetic devotion 
His energy, stamina, and steadfastness of purpose were impressive. He finished the last volume of his Fall of the Mughal Empire in 1950 at the age of 80, and then went on to complete a military history of India, which was published shortly after his death in 1985. So he was 88 uh, when he finished that final book. His self-control seems never to have faltered, and as Debesh points out, his backbone was literally as well as figuratively stiff. Um, you should look at the illustration on page 239. Uh, this was surely a veritable hero of scholarship. So what then was his tragic flaw? As I read the account, the flaw was in large part, in a sense, historical. Sarkar was fundamentally a product, a peculiar product, uh, but a fascinating one, of the British Raj. He imbibed European historical reference and scholarly norms, and he internalized English literature and language. He was actually a professor of English, not of history. He fully assimilated the views of the great British historians of the 19th century who believed that character was the key to historical development. For Sarkar, it was the failings of the later Mughal emperor's character that explained their inability to keep India united and to put it on the road to modern nationhood. Sarkar believed to the end of his days, that is, for more than a decade past Indian independence, in the liberal virtues of the British Empire, that Britain's rule, as humiliating as it might be to a great civilization like India, was in fact providing India with the domestic peace, economic development, science, and liberal legal and political norms that would, over time, raise his country to its rightful place in the modern world. Sarkar, one might say, made himself an ideal citizen of a liberal empire that actually existed only in rhetoric, not on the ground in his country, where the supposed liberal virtues of the empire were all too often overwhelmed by British economic exploitation, political repression, racism, and high-handedness. Sarkar despised the Indian nationalists, politicians and historians alike, for their willingness to cater for, to what he regarded as the superstitions and lower instincts of the masses. In the field of history, this manifested itself in a lofty arrogance toward younger historians who resented the British, supported the independence movement, and believed that history should contribute to Indian, or worse, Hindu or local, particularly Marathi, nationalism. Thus, the world and the practice of history swept by him, uh, leaving him and his friend Sardesai isolated and bitter rather than honored in their old age. Now, Depeche, of course, belonged to a generation that believed that history should serve not Sarkar's absolute and rather desiccated standard of truth with a capital T, but rather should be deeply motivated by political ideals and should equip us to understand and transform for the better our contemporary world. Depeche's current work on environmental history certainly continues in that vein. But in this book, through the melancholy story of Jadunath Shah Sarkar, a man who himself believed in the uh, illusion that the content and example of his scholarship would help to build a more modern, rational, and disciplined India, Depeche seems to hint that our desire to make our own scholarly work relevant to social progress may in the end, be illusory as well. Thank you. I'll also stand up. And, um, <clears throat> First of all, um, thank you, Martha and Bill, for those very thoughtful um, comments. And I'll um, try to connect back to some of them, at least. But I also want to thank my colleagues in 3City and Lisa Woodin in particular and uh, for wanting to do this and um, Anwen for helping to organize this. Um, it's a tremendous privilege to actually uh, have one's book read. <laughs> there are so many books that come out. I, I, mean, I often feel scared in the university. I look at, you know, I thought every room is going to produce a book. <laughs> why should people read mine? Yeah. And I, I think that's something we all think about. 
So when it actually gets read, and there are very few people in the world who actually can demand our absolute attention and can and can uh, command the place where we actually read them very carefully. Most of the time, uh, as my friend Arjun Appadurai used to say on the phone, Dipesh, on my first reading, which will also be my last reading, <laughs> <laughs> this is what I think. <laughs> so I'm, I'm tremendously grateful that you know for people who have read the book and to my two very busy uh, colleagues here, very esteemed and valued colleagues here, for having actually spent time reading the book. And thank you to everybody for, for coming here. So very quickly, um, yes, I mean, um, uh, when a good friend introduced me in, uh, uh, in one of my lectures on Sarkar in Delhi, Tanika Sarkar actually, huh. uh, described Jadunathan and, 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 and myself as she said she couldn't imagine two more different kind of historians. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll tell you where, it, where the book comes from. The book um, comes from a dilemma that, that I never resolved in any absolute terms through my uh, growth as a historian in the 80s and 90s. And the dilemma was that in doing subaltern studies, clearly the, um, the Dalits, the uh, formerly untouchable groups, when they were trying to assert the value of their pasts in, uh, in public life, some of them made, made it very clear that they wouldn't go by the rules of history in order to find the past that they valued. And we actually published an, a piece by a, an intellectual who was not himself Dalit, but identified with the Dalits in subaltern studies, Kancha Ayel Naya, who began by saying that I will deliberately avoid looking at sources. And he made claims that we were very uneasy with as historians. We thought they were not true for anybody who knew the history. but. His claim was that he had a better understanding of the, that experience of the oppression through his own experience. That is the historical oppression of the Dalits through his own experience as a Dalit. And, um, and, we, and because Dalits are already powerful in certain sense in India, not in the sense that everyday oppressions have gone, I and mean, there are clearly everyday instances of oppression, but politically they count in a particular way now. We felt obliged to publish. The, we had a lot of debate about whether we should publish it as a point of view, as a separate article, and in the end we decided anything we did in that sort of manner would only appear to be ghettoizing him or marginalizing him. So we actually published it as a mainstream article in subaltern studies. And this was also, 80s were also when I was, uh, I mean I finished my PhD in 83 and I was I started teaching in Melbourne University in 85, and Aboriginal history, Indigenous history, became a subject the year I started teaching. And I encountered the same problem. And then I realized that globally, one form of um, kind of democratization of history or democratization of past consciousness that, was, that it was globally taking was um, of a practice that eventually was articulated as a demand um, by many, where people kept saying, my testimony is my history. And I knew by then, having been trained to be a historian, that a historian's job is actually to question testimony. Mm. I mean, a historian can never write from the position that somebody's testimony was history. But in the Australian case, where the Aboriginals only had 200 years of written history, because, and from all European sources, uh, settler colonial sources, their point of view was that, uh, you know, we don't have writing in our culture, so we don't have those kinds of sources, the source is already biased, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And, uh, and in the end, this demand actually politically trumped uh, the point of view that we were initially trying to argue in subaltern studies that um, Carlo Ginzburg would have argued in his different way in uh, Cheese and the Worms, that there could be ways of questioning testimony, even when testimony came from a group that was biased against uh, the group you were writing about, uh, that could kind of still, ways that it could still respect forms of doing history. In other words, the historian's quest for what happened. Um, 
without necessarily siding with the oppressor. But clearly, that argument was not enough. Either there was a failure on the part of historians to produce examples of that sort of history that satisfied uh, the indigenous people in Australia or the Dalits in India. Um, and there were other things happening. So actually, Dalits were in Indian public life in Uttar Pradesh, in one state, very important state. They were clearly inventing historical characters or allegedly historical characters whose existence you can't document from archives. About the 1857 rebellion, uh, about older kings. Uh, there, was a, uh, there was a very interesting uh, sculptural challenge to one person who was building sculptures, uh, images, of kings who didn't exist. So what would you make them look like? <laughs> Uh, and, and all this stuff was coming out, actually, in the writings of a young scholar, Badri Narayan, who was studying Dalit representations of their past in public life. On the other hand, when I came to America, it was clear that while the kind of criticisms of history or discussion around history that was developing in, that I saw uh, being very powerful in Australia and being very powerful in India, where historians were not as um, didn't feel very you know, strong enough to be able to oppose those things. The situation in America was different, and it was clear that American, the profession is much larger, and the profession itself can carry on um, developing the profession in somewhat sort of uh, keeping some distance from what you might call popular history or trade history or history in the public life, the kind of histories that you might buy or that anthropologists would sometimes talk about. Uh, representations of the past where um, you don't necessarily uh, go by the historian's way. So there's a very interesting book on Colonial Williamsburg, uh, which is set up as an exhibition of uh, the slavery's past. And, and the anthropologist who wrote this describes how there are two kinds of guides. There are official guides who tells you <coughs> about what happened, the history of individual houses. And there are apparently um, African-American guides who, who take you <coughs> into um, the story of possession, like who look at houses and say, you know, there are ghosts in these houses because there was, you know, the, 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 the owner of the slaves slept with slave women and there were these, all these children who were not recognized, et cetera, et cetera. And if you apparently put the same questions to the official guides, they would say, well, uh, you can definitely say from the sources that there was miscegenation, but the sources don't help you to pinpoint which families were involved, right? Whereas with these other guys were making the claim that this family had this story. So this kind of di distinction, the pressure between popular legends and stories and what you tell from the archives was much more visible in the anthropological writing, whereas the strength of the profession and uh, what, what I... And then there was the Jagannath Sarkar story. And what I realized in many ways was that while there were professional debates on, because this, this impact of this form of democratization, where um, people were not prepared to actually go through universities, understand the rational procedures of history, and then talk about their past. They'd been given citizenship rights, they'd been brought into public life, and they were already raising questions about what sort of past do I need in order to feel proud of my past? And that was the question in, in Marathi history, and that was impinging. And I realized that, A, in reading those letters between Sarkar, that these were old questions. I mean, clearly those questions had been formulated in India very clearly as early as 1930s, probably even earlier than that. And they were in public life and legislative assemblies questions were being asked. But also, what I, it made me realize something else. And it, and this something else is what I try to track or try to highlight in the book. This is that <coughs> when I go back, or when I went back to the debates of the 80s and 90s, and there were very many books written in, in defense of history against these kind of tendencies uh, <coughs> to claim other pasts as histories, which had by then become intellectualized. Keith Jenkins's postmodern history or Ashish Nandi's attack on history or whatever. And there were people who were writing, defending the rational core of history. Um, 
Carlo wrote a very interesting book called History Rhetoric Proof and actually making a distinction, as I remember, between Aristotelian notions of rhetoric and Nietzschean notions of rhetoric. Um, what I realized was that in those debates, whether against Hayden White or for Hayden White, what we didn't account for was the history of the institution that created particular um, arenas for the debate to take place. In other words, I found that in American, the university history departments, because of professionalization, because of numbers, because of all of those things, were strong enough to actually make room for, de for these debates to take place on general principles. So, you could, so history could take the shape of, of a form of knowledge of, about which you can speak in generality. Like you could ask, what is history? What are the methods of history? What is the rational core of history? And so I saw Carlo's book and other's book answering questions in that vein. And I realized that universities historically in a place, and, and I thought German universities had that kind of strength. But universities in, in India didn't have that kind of strength. Uh, so that the whole question, as I say, of historical research, truth, come, it happens in public life. And Sarkar is trying to give history a rational sort of spine in his own terms in debates which take place in public life. I mean, he's teaching literature in the university. But history doesn't become a researchable <coughs> subject until 1919 in one university. And then mostly around the late 20s and early 30s. And you have to remember that even at the end of um, British rule in 1947, India has only 17 universities. Now India has about 600. Um, so I realized that, a, so in a way, um, maybe a kind of a, a, a Foucauldian impulse that, that, yes, there are these debates, but what allows for these debates to go in certain areas in, or in certain directions or, or not uh, is partly decided by these institutional arenas. But what I was also fascinated by is an older, in Sarkar, and you know, um, and because he was so different, what I was also fascinated by uh, something that was not necessarily unique about Sarkar, but actually was a position taken by many intellectuals in the 19th century in search of truth. So I think of a letter that Ranka writes to his brother Heinrich around 1823 when he's in Rome. And Rome plays a very interesting role in the lives of the early historians, where he says that I feel a priestly sense of exaltation. <laughs> when I actually, I mean, I'm confronted with the question of finding truth in history. Um, William James, actually, from a different point of view, writes that you have to choke down your preferences when you're looking for the truth. So this question of yeah. the certain asceticism. Um, Max Weber repeats a similar point in Science as Vocation. Um, what he calls an intellectual aristocracy, and he calls, and he says that intellectual aristocracy can only be produced by forming, by performing a certain kind of asceticism. And his, his argument against a mass lecture format, he says that you can't practice asceticism if your class is full of 200 people. <laughs> so, and then of course Mark Plock, in the historian's craft, I mean, coming from a very different tradition again. I mean, not a, you know, we're not talking about sort of German Protestantism here speaks, at least in translation, uses the expression, honest submission to truth. Mm. And, and this I found in Sarkar also, this idea that being true about the past meant more being truthful about the past than getting to any final truth. So in a, in a sense, being truthful became a way of cultivating your own self. Mm. Um, uh, it, it became a way of uh, uh, having a certain comportment. And, and, uh, and the interesting thing was that everybody remembers Sarkar as a character, either an elevating character or a strange character. And one little detail I discuss is he had this, he had this idea, Germanic idea of a research library. So and it made me realize that most of our libraries are not research libraries. We have second and third hand books. His library was mainly of original documents that he would procure under great difficulty. And uh, and he has this idea of a genuine researcher. So if he, he would allow you to use his library, but you have to, you have to sort of convince him that you knew Persian. Otherwise, he would just shut the door on you. And then for the first three days, he wouldn't tell you where the bathroom was. 
<laughs> just to just to be convinced that you were a real researcher you're not a sham <laughs> and on the on the third day his grandchild would come and tell you show you where the bathroom was uh, at 3 at 3 in the afternoon he would let you have a tea break so he'll bring you a cup of tea in his own library and he'd sit down there and sip a cup of tea himself but not speak a word if she, if somebody came to talk to him he would talk to them with a, a pocket watch in hand and then in the middle of the sentence he would just return to his study and say you can go and look at my garden <laughs> so people at the same time he would actually put up students in his household sometimes more than one simultaneously at his own expense if he was convinced that they wanted to study and know and so i became very interested to in know so what why was even if he had that let's say the idea of being truthful which is clearly discarded in contemporary politics i was interested in knowing why it carried a value for him and why it sort of acquired a larger significance and what was interesting to um, realize there and that this goes back to ambedkar and the point you were making martha was that um clearly there were many different kinds of nationalisms uh, at work in india before independence and this was a nationalism that lost out but this was a nationalism that thought of politics not in terms of interests so by the 1920s 30s if you look at hindu politics or muslim politics you know people are talking about this is caste politics people are saying this is our interest our interest can be represented by uh, by these people these politicians and not by that politicians or indians would say only nationalists can represent our interests mm. but there was an older um, idea of politics which i think is a more classical idea of politics uh, which is recycled through the rhetoric of the empire not the reality of it and if you go back to 1960 look at somebody like gandhi i think there are many products of the imperial rhetoric who take the empire seriously at its word who think that becoming political is about cultivating this character where you fight against um the vices in yourself that you think could make the nation vicious and uh so and i was fascinated by the long life of this other idea of politics because i had grown up uh, on the on the different idea of politics that politics was about interests marxism told you about class interests and uh, interests of capitalist class and you know so i was fascinated to find that there was a kind of that the empire through its rhetoric whatever its flaws on the ground had enabled a different conception of politics and you know in in writing provincializing europe i made a distinction between what i called um the not yet position of many imperialist thinkers so i went to john stuart mill and said look john stuart mill said there can't be any universal adult education a vote uh, franchise without universal adult education and that's like saying get educated first and then get the vote whereas i was saying the indian gesture of giving peasants the vote overnight was really a gesture of repudiating this what i call the waiting room the, the period of waiting in history and i look at and look at the reforms of the 60s the civil rights movement the granting of um, not the vote but the granting of uh, the counting of aboriginals in australian censuses for the first time they were counted as part of the nation 66 um i see all of those things as these other mode of 20th century democracy which was hastened by the two wars actually so that the imperialist powers had felt obliged to give rights to people and many people held out against this new idea of politics tagore included sarkar gandhi is a person who changed from one idea of politics to another gandhi makes this tremendous flip and i realized that the the idea that the nation should wait to be adequate to uh, the task of being modern and politically modern was not just the imperialists alone that many indian intellectuals have been brought up on that idea and took it seriously and took it seriously enough for that to mold their character and the idea of truth so there are all those things playing around basically in the book uh, um but obviously i just wanted to say uh, one little thing that 
but clearly even granting all that sarkar's methods were clearly older than our generation and the even as i say even the burkhartian kind of departure from rankian positions um he hadn't encountered he hadn't raised the question of looking at mughal paintings for instance um the kind of questions that uh, momiliano would later raise in the article on antiquarianism um and the other thing that also i must uh, uh, acknowledge my debt to uh, some debates with arguments with carlo here um in writing this book which was that in an early article that carlo wrote uh, on hayden white um uh, quite an early article his criticism one of the criticisms he made of white which stuck with me was saying that hayden white does not raise any of his positions or points through his own research in the archives i mean he raises these points generally but they're not connected to his own activity in the archives and and in some ways this book afforded me a way of getting back into the archives to find a way of answering my own doubts and dilemmas on this debate of the 18 and 90s on which i knew that i sat on a wall because i had admiration uh, for people who looked for rational answers looked for truth and and who defended the idea of rationality in history and i had a democratic strong sense of sympathy for all these oppressed groups who felt that the discipline did not answer their needs for democratic participation in public life and and so in the end what i've produced then is what bill was describing kindly but if you wanted to describe it unkindly in althusser's terms i was producing a historical relativism saying you know uh, those were ideas that people trained in a particular time followed but at the same time martha was quite right you know i was still i was wanting to confront this man within a structure of intimacy yeah. in yes. order to ha have a dialectic hook of both identification mm -hmm. and distance yeah. at work in the book and so that's very possible thank you very much yeah thank you <laughs>